Uh, uh, dear our viewers, uh, welcome to our program, Freely and Critically. Today, our guest, associate professor from Czech Republic, uh, Bruno University. Uh, assistant professor. Assistant professor only. Only assistant professor, but a political <laughs> science expert, Werner uh, Binder. Uh, and as always, uh, my colleague Professor Gento Tasmujekis, and today we're going to talk about uh, polarization uh, in Germany with a comparison with the Czech Republic. Uh, as I understand, we have in Germany now two different uh, polarizations. One polarization is uh, in terms of Ukraine, pacifism, uh, pacifistic attitudes in Germany, and uh, militaristic help for Ukraine. Uh, the one polarization in society and uh, as I see among politicians and another kind of uh, perspective for German polarization seems to be radical uh, uh, right with uh, very strong anti-migrant uh, attitudes and uh, another part of society with liberal openness for, for migrants. So, dear Werner, how do you see this polarization? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. So I'm um, very much interested and also worried um, also as a German citizen about political polarization, while I, um, which is also one of the reasons why I became involved in a, an EU cost project on political polarization, where I work with people from different European countries on political polarization. How can we conceptualize it, but also empirically how it's developing in different countries on the ground and also what are the possible ways to kind of address it. And uh, polarization, it's not just something that is happening in society, it's also something that is a lot talked about in the media in Germany, um, quite a bit. And um, and also kind of, yeah, diagnosis of our times as, uh, yeah, more polarized than ever. And uh, often the kind of comparison, implicit comparison of the United States that, um, oh, we are on the road to kind of becoming like um, the United States, which are kind of perceived as a um, polarized society. But if one looks really, I think at most recent, um, 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 yeah, empirical research on polarization, you actually get a little bit of a dip different picture. That it might actually, that polarization on many topics is not as big as it seems, um, but that it's also partially a phenomenon that is created by media discourses um, and also by um, politic uh, political actors and um, um, symbolic entrepreneurs that that kind of use it to um, um, bolster their agenda. So um, to give an example, I think that in Germany, um, the vast majority of people um, criticize and reject um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the full scale war. But at the same time, um, so there is, I think, not really a polarization um, with regard to this. There are kind of pockets of alternative ways of seeing the war. Maybe the uh, partially the older generation um, of um, Russian German migrants um, 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 that uh, came to Germany. The younger ones are often in a kind of intergenerational conflict with their parents that watch uh, are much more stronger following the Russian official media. And there is also, I think, an East-West divide in the perception of Russia, which is quite important. But I think there is a kind of consensus that um, um, uh, that, yeah, what Russia is doing is not okay by any kind of standards. But at the same time, there is an interpretation conflict about what should be Germany's role in it. Uh, and this is also where you get all these kind of alliances that you have, like West German leftist pacifist that don't want Germany to be involved too much in the war, as well as conservative people from the East that have a certain kind of uh, Russophilia. Um, so, um, and there is quite a strong um, debate in this regard uh, uh, in German society. 
um, and about how to uh, continue. But what is not so much debated is the fact that um, what Russia did uh, is a kind of violation and a humanitarian catastrophe, especially for the people in the Ukraine. Uh, my question is regarding polarization, first of all, uh, because you mentioned that this is an important concept, and you know that ordinary we consider that uh, opposition are very good for democracy from the one side, that sometimes critical theory emphasizes that even contradictions are good because it's, uh, you know, uh, support political movements, activism, visions, energy, in any way, that's uh, from the other side, uh, you discuss and Thomas asked, it looks like some negative, you know, concept of polarization. Can you explain where the good polarization or positive is uh, finished and where started this one toxic? I mean, if I really could explain it, um, then uh, I think we already would have solved um, um, a, a lot of the problem of this European cost project. This is exactly the, the question that we are kind of asking ourselves. So, um, and I think people are right to stress that there is this positive side um, to polarization, that people become kind of politically engaged and, and motivated um, 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 to engage in political debates. And if you look, for example, to Russia um, as an example, I mean, at least on the kind of um, a large part of Putin's strategy has to kind of demobilize, uh, demobilize um, 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 the, his citizens um, to not um, make them care much about politics. I mean, it changed with the war um, quite a bit. But it's, of course, disastrous for the democratic culture um, of a society if there is nothing really up for debate, if there are not a kind of um, discursive conflicts in the society. So I think, um, as I see it at the moment, I think um, when it comes to a specific kind of political issues, um, polarization is a good thing and something that we want in our um, democratic societies. It becomes a problem when people, um, when on specific issues, um, your opinion seems to kind of determine how, what kind of opinion you should also have on other matters. And when um, a certain kind of coalition is formed between your position on different kind of issues, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, with regard, um, when there is a coalition uh, formed. To give an example that, um, a lot of um, people who were kind of active and very critically opposed to mainstream COVID politics in Germany. And this was a topic that was popular among right wing, radical right wing actors, as well as some people from the left, green, liberally minded sector of society, which is, it has a certain kind of German history, this kind of ecological consciousness, which is often goes into the direction of criticizing science, criticizing the intervention of science in, in the life world, vaccinations, uh, medi certain forms of medications and other things. Um, and some of those people also have shifted now in the debate or, or when the, the war, full scale war against the Ukraine started to this kind of, um, yeah, critical position, criticizing the support um, for Ukraine. And um, so there, there seems to be kind of, um, yeah, a, a kind of coalition form that there are a certain kind of anti-establishment discourse is kind of forming. And uh, once a new topic kind of uh, pops up, a lot of people will be kind of in this kind of anti-establishment um, um, mindset and maybe for, just take the talking points and a critical or a positional view on the kind of hegemonic talking points when the kind of next concept comes. So this I'm kind of worried about also democratically because using maybe uh, um, Laclau and Mouffe um, and their work on um, um, agonistic pluralism um, and especially I think it's 
especially lucid in the book that Laclau wrote on populism, that the kind of pure democratic logic would be to discuss each issue separately. And there is no problem if people are polarized with each issue. Uh, issue. But once a kind of um, discursive front forms that ties a lot of things together, discourse against immigration, discourse about vaccinations, COVID, discourse about um, militarization or how to uh, um, support the Ukraine, then it becomes dangerous. Then it kind of limits the discourse. The polarization. When this polarization is uh, becomes problem and when it's very positive because democracy presupposes alternatives, uh, different uh, positions, uh, discussions. Even sometimes we discuss about uh, usefulness of contradiction because it inspires people, uh, gives energy, you know, put forward. And from the other side, now we hear more and more that uh, polarization means something, uh, you know, threat for society and even for political, uh, you know, stability of the country. What's your opinion about uh, polarization? What does it mean? Yeah. Um, I, I believe that it's really important to distinguish different levels of uh, polarization. That, of course, you can have polarization on issues, on specific political issues, on migration, on Germany's stance um, uh, in the war against Ukraine, on uh, um, things like, for example, COVID vaccinations and COVID policies. And these kind of polarization and disagreements and public debates about specific issues, they are, I think, um, very healthy um, for a democracy. They are necessary for a democratic culture. At the same time, I think it becomes a problem once this kind of attitudes and opinions towards different issues are kind of um, connected with each other. That because you take this stance against migration, you should also support, for example, Putin in his uh, war of aggression against the Ukraine, um, for example. And this is something that we see, for example, also in the United um, States happening, that your um, opinion on certain kind of key issues, things like abortion or immigration, also kind of um, incentivizes you to take on the opinions also on other matter, uh, matters of the party that you kind of support and follow. So this is, um, I think, uh, something when it becomes really complicated, when you have in a society emerging kind of two opposing fronts, that um, um, that have um, opposite um, attitude um, towards um, uh, um, a variety of political issues. Um, and then it becomes even more dangerous, I think, once this kind of, this group of people start to develop into um, self-contained social groups, or if this kind of cor correlates with social structural um, 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 characteristics um, of uh, certain groups. So there is a kind of social foundation on this kind of polarization on the discursive level. And then, of course, I think the most extreme end on the polarization spectrum is a, a kind of, yeah, civil war, that people don't think of themselves, of their fellow citizens as actually belonging to the same society even if they have different opinions, but think of themselves as enemies and the others as enemies of the, the true people. And, um, and this is really something that um, um, uh, I'm worried about, though it seems that empirical research, at least in Europe, um, um, shows that um, despite the fact that certain issues are highly polarized, there is a kind of broad consensus um, in many um, topics. Um, so, for example, on uh, migration, there is a broad consensus in Germany about uh, that we need controlled migration. Um, there is also consensus even about helping people in need of fleeing from a war and to support them. Um, the, 
differences and the conflicts start, um, what kind of criteria to apply? Um, um, who is a kind of good uh, migrant and who is not? And what kind of extent of migration um, do we need? So there are very few people who oppose immigration totally, and very few people who uh, um, want to abolish borders and want to abolish the nation. I mean, there are also radical leftists who, who uh, advocate this position, but they are not really uh, the majority uh, in Germany. And the same, I think, applies also to the case of um, Russia's war of aggression in the Ukraine, that there are very few people in Germany that support Russia, but there are also probably very few people that would actually support direct military intervention of Germany in the Ukraine on behalf of the Ukrainian people. Um, yeah. Then just one uh, more question about this polarization, because you touch unexpected for me this civil war question. Yeah, and uh, I now discussed with some Ukrainians and Russian opposition about possibilities of civil war in uh, Russia, and we describe uh, Russian situation as latent, latent uh, civil war uh, while in, on the borders with uh, Ukraine. They have the cases of real civil war because four Russian battalions, real Russian citizens, fights against uh, Russia in Belgorod uh, district now, you know. And even Putin today recognized that there are approximately 2,500 and, uh, 2, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, people uh, who fights uh, against Russians who fights against Russians. It's gross uh, per year. It means more than 300 percentage. It means that next year probably it will be approximately 10,000 of Russians who will fight. And then we see that uh, the, this war transforms into a civil war. From the other side, Putin always uh, supported so-called, uh, you know, uh, hybrid war, where he would like to inspire some fifth colon, you know, to start mm -hmm. some uh, movements and even el with uh, some elements of civil war, like in Donbass, they dreams, uh, he dreams about the same situation maybe in Latvia or Estonia to, to start such kind of activities or maybe in Moldova. But why not about uh, Germany? Why not uh, this? What use, what, how, what's your opinion? Uh, what can be co cause for the uh, growing of threat of civil war in EUP? In the, in, on the territory of European Union in general, or maybe even in some parts of uh, Germany's uh, uh, S Slovakia or Czech Republic or somewhere. What's your, what's your opinion about civil war? Because you started this one question. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe I shouldn't have started. <laughs> no, uh, I think one kind of obvious uh, example in the Western world is um, the um, the attack on the Capitol um, after the um, last elections in, in the United States. And I think there you could see a glimpse of civil war. Once there is a kind of um, rejection of official institutions, election outcomes, and the use of violence against the political opponent and also against the institutions. And this, I think, um, is um, it's kind of an inherent possibility of the uh, political, that um, uh, modern liberal democracies function by domesticating the kind of conflict potential, that it's an agonism, not an antagonism, as uh, Chantal Mouffe uh, would say. But there is always the possibility that it kind of shifts into a kind of antagonism, which in its most extreme form, um, speaking with Carl Schmidt, um, it's then about the enemy who, um, um, whose uh, existence has to be kind of completely negated, who has to be kind of killed. Um, and this is the kind of enemy in the um, political sense. I don't see it neither in Germany or the Czech Republic and the rest of Europe, I would say, um, uh, this kind of strong um, polarization. Um, 
I don't see a lot of uh, yeah armed resistance against governments. I mean, one example, of course, could be from Germany, this um, Reichsbürger um, associations, where uh, which uh, recently, a couple of months ago, um, the um, police um, um, put some people into um, custody that were conspiring against the German government. And these are people who don't believe actually in the legal basis of um, the um, Federal Republic of Germany. They believe that they actually, this is why they are called Reichsbürger, they still believe they live in the German Reich and are not bound by the institutions of the society. And they were actually planning for a coup. Um, and they even already kind of um, divided the ministries um, uh, among uh, each other and who should have what position. But these people are kind of crazy by contemporary standards. There is not a possibility to kind of make a coup in Germany at the moment that will enjoy popular legitimacy. I'm not so sure about the US. Um, um, if um, um, people doing a coup would get the military on the side and if they were able to kind of overturn certain election results, um, some people would um, maybe a broad a majority of people would support them because they are from their side um, and they, they are doing the right thing, although it's um, they're kind of um, um, attacking the institutions. So um, I don't see the potential in Europe for these kind, this kind of civil war, uh, civil war um, which um, I think is based on the rejection of institutions that regulate democratic life and second on the willingness to kill your political enemy. And of course, in Russia, it's a different story because the legitimacy of the system, I mean, um, the elections, it, it's just uh, um, fraud and the spectacle. Um, uh, even a lot of Russians do not believe in them um, per se. And I, I'm not that surprised that Russians are taking up also the fight uh, against Putin. So. Don't hear. We don't hear you. Uh, if we had to compare um, uh, Germany's uh, types of polarization with uh, uh, the situation in the Czech Republic or Slovakia, uh, since you you live in the Czech Republic and you teach here, uh, what is uh, your opinion about the, the differences and similarities. Uh, the Czech Republic is much smaller and the Czech Republic has um, uh, this experience of being uh, occupied by the Soviet Union. What, what semi-occupation, Warsaw Pact, uh, um, uh, no, not the same occupation as the Baltic states uh, used to be. Um, but uh, the Czech Republic has the spirit of Václav Havel, this uh, the spirit of the legacy of um, being a dissident. Uh, how does it somehow play today in the context of the war in Ukraine uh, for the support of uh, Ukraine? Um, what, do, what, do you, what do you see here happening? Yeah. I mean, uh, there, it's a huge difference. Um, and I think um, questions of collective memory or cultural memory really play an important role to account for differences in how, for example, in Germany, um, people responded to the situation, but also how um, uh, uh, the difference between East and West Germany, and then also the difference between uh, Germany uh, and the Czech Republic. And I was in the first days of the full scale um, invasion of the Ukraine, I was approached constantly uh, by people that knew me, uh, who begged me that I should in Germany um, um, raise awareness for the Ukrainian cause, uh, um, or for cause. So um, that in um, in the Czech Republic, very immediately there was a broad consensus and a condemnation of Russia, and it even not only extended to people that followed uh, are in the spirit of um, Václav Havel and uh, in the dissident spirit, but even Miller Seaman, who arguably won the first presidential 
election, I think in 2013, I think even with financial support from Russia, and he's been a very Russian friendly um, um, president for the most time of his tenure. Um, and even he became uneasy when Russia started to make alternative history, portraying 1968 as a um, um, and the um, um, cracking down on the um, uh, the um, liberalization efforts in Czechoslovakia. And he even became uneasy and asked uh, the Russian state television that they're they're actually not telling um, uh, the truth there, that it's not the CIA that kind of um, did this plots that it was um, a legitimate uh, movement that was cracked down by um, um, uh, force and power. And after the full scale invasion, Milo Seman, who has been a long friend of Russia, um, unequivocally kind of condemned um, um, Putin's uh, um, yeah, attack on the Ukraine and expressed his support for the Ukrainian people. So there is, I think, a huge consensus and much more um, um, drive from the very beginning to support Ukrainians, openness also towards Ukrainian refugees. Everywhere you see, saw, and still see Ukrainian flags. At my faculty, faculty, we still have the Ukrainian flag flying since the invasion began. It's still there. Um, but at the same time, of course, there's also conflict and dissonance. Um, and it's now getting in the last months also stronger concerns about um, with the inflation and um, worsening economic conditions. How much should we support Ukraine? Um, how much should we support Ukrainian um, refugees? So and this is where the kind of um, dividing line is and where also the kind of populists, they cannot win on the ticket of supporting Putin but they can make an argument about it's not in our national interest to be kind of to overstretch ourselves in, in our support of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Um, it's not in our interest to, uh, to generously support Ukrainian refugees, which the Czech Republic does not. I mean, they have a lot of refugees, but they are not um, su yeah, supporting them very generously. So I think, yeah, but in comparison to Germany, it was really very different that in Germany, very much confusing uh, confusion in the beginning of the first weeks, um, very hesitant the German government to taking, yeah, really clear stance in the conflict. And when finally the Germans did in the Czech pub, I was suddenly greeted by a friend and he hugged me. So glad that you are on our side, that the Germany is with us, with the Czech Republic. And it's, of course, of the experience that uh, the Czechs had being in the Soviet sphere of influence, being liberated by um, the Soviets, and um, then also the um, um, 1968, the Prague Spring that was squashed um, with uh, the military backing of the Soviet Union. And what is perhaps for me the most surprising thing is you would also expect in Eastern Germany such a sentiment, but that's not the case. Absolutely not. That in Eastern Germany seems to be very, quite a lot of Russell, Russophilia um, is there. And this was something because I also not only live in the Czech Republic where I teach, but I also live here um, close to Dresden um with my family where also putin was stationed in the 1980s and um, a lot of um, um Dresdners still kind of remember fondly or think of putin fondly as someone who speaks german who knows dresden and uh, this was really the most puzzling thing that and you experience it here in interactions with people that they um, are very critical towards the official um, stance of Germany in the war and the support for Ukraine. On a very flimsy basis, they don't know much about Russia. They had Russian in school. They have a certain attachment to Russian culture. Uh, and, and it's maybe because of the reason that I stated before, um, 
and you have this also with the issue of migration and the issue of COVID. It was much more polarized in the East. And people are so accustomed to take this to take this kind of anti-governmental oppositional attitude, dissident attitude, one might even call it, that um, people were easy to kind of flip um, towards this kind of more pro-Putin discourses. You have to understand Russia. Oh, all those Ukrainian refugees, see what big cars they drive when they come here. Are they even kind of real refugees and things like this? This is something that you hear in the east uh, um, um, of Germany um, quite a bit and much more than in Western Germany, for example. There is still the wall in our heads, as we uh, kind of call it, uh, in Germany. And there is, of course, also Western, in the West, the strong criticism um, of um, the government support of Ukraine, but it's mainly motivated by this pacifist. Um, yeah. Werner, uh, it's nice that you mentioned if you touched uh, the question of pacif pacifism here. And before you mentioned about Carl Smith and the others, you know, and uh, Shantay Mukher and Laclau, but first of all, important uh, Carl Smith because his separation between friends and enemies. It's very clear, antagonistic, you know, uh, issue of uh, politics and uh, as well for us, it's pro-Putinist, anti-Putinist, those who fight uh, for Ukraine and against Putin and who fight uh, against Ukraine, pro-Putin, you know, that's quite clear. But uh, in, in the Europe, we see the third camp, it's pacifism. Pacifism as something different, it's not so simple, you know, it's not binary logic, as a minimum triple logic, minimum triple logic, it's probably more, but at least tri triple logic, and this even uh, uh, so-called camp of pacifists consists from different forces, as well they are not uh, the same, they are quite, uh, quite uh, different. You know, in, in, in it looks like that pacifism sometimes can be used, you know, some as some instrument for manipulation, you know. And uh, uh, as well, it looks like for instrument uh, of uh, popul fro And from the other side is populism as well, very big populism. I am for, uh, for, I am for peace, a peacemaker, you know, it means uh, you should accept me, you so nice, pretty and uh, good, you know, and so on. What, what is your opinion in your picture of polarization? What does it mean this uh, peacemaking, peace uh, demanding, you know? Is it uh, the element of uh, polarization or something different? <sighs> so, it's a very good question. And I think it's not really, yeah. As you said, it's kind of, it seems it's a third element. Um, that kind of um, comes into play here. Though it might be in, I mean, in Germany, there are not many pro-Putinists. So in a, in a certain way, in the kind of critical camp, um, it might actually play a more important role than um, explicit kind of um, pro-Putin uh, voices, which you have very few. And even the kind of populist kind of refrain. And it's like, with um, um, the uh, Czech Republic that they would rather use, it's not in our national interest to kind of, um, um, yeah, get deeper into the conflict. And it's in our national interest to kind of create peace. And even uh, um, if this peace is to the disadvantage of um, Ukraine. So, um, and I think, um, and it's uh, very interesting that, uh, I mean, I think it's very strong also uh, on the left and especially in West um, um, Germany, this discourse and also this fear <clears throat> of nuclear war um, that was very important for the kind of ecological movement, uh, fighting against nuclear plants, but also always kind of this threat of nuclear war and this kind of pacifist um, ideology. And it plays really a, um, a huge um, uh, uh, importance here. But maybe it's also something that is not really kind of deep held political conviction. I think many people who who kind of um, um, advocate in the name of peace for a very quick resolution of the conflict, they just want to be let, left alone. 
they they don't they don't want to be threatened they want it's a kind, very kind of i think narrow minded thinking that they, they just want to live in peace um and peace in freedom uh, peace for everyone um even if it comes at the expense of of the ukraine so um and i think that this is very attractive um um for many pe people in germany that um that the peace um uh, would uh, benefit them it would put them kind of at ease they could sleep better um they would not have to be afraid of nuclear bombs um dropping on on um germany but there is of course um i mean a danger that in a certain way it's a, this three triangle that you kind of made up um pacifism is to some extent it's not a tenable um position you can only afford to be pacifist if you're defended by someone. This is what Max Weber writes about um, the pacifist sects, um, where he, in his politics as vocation, he talks about it. That pacifism in the US was only possible because you had in specific sects, because it was the state that protected them, that allowed them actually to be pacifist. Um, otherwise, pacifism, radical pacifism is not, it's, um, 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 it it work. It's a uh, Gesinnungsethik. It's not Verantwortungsethik. It's not an um, ethics of responsibility, but it's an it's a value ethic that is not really um, um, uh, tenable. And of course, the kind of important um, reference here in the discourse is appeasement politics. That this kind of the pacifist attempt um, to kind of pacify Adolf Hitler, which um, um, other people use in the discourse to discredit the position. And I think it's also important from the um, Czech perspective, because when in Germany debates came up, yeah, then um, Biden should kind of meet with Trump and create, no, not with Trump, with uh, Putin, and um, make peace discussions over the head of the Ukraine. But the problem is, for example, um, with the Czech experience and the um, Munich Agreement in 1938 that divided the country without actually um, having the Czechoslovaks a say in the whole procedure. And it didn't prevent the war that it was supposed to prevent. It just, um, um, and in Germany, there lacks this kind of sensi uh, this sensitivity for these issues that, uh, and in the Czech Republic or in Poland, um, um, the Hitler-Stalin Pact or Ribbentrop-Molotov um, Pact is a similar issue that we cannot just let decide superpowers create, let them create peace, let them carve up the map, and let's create a peaceful situation for all of us. But this is what many, I think, many Germans hope would be the kind of ideal outcome. Trump gets elected, and he gets to the table with uh, Putin, and then they carve up the map and create peace. And many Germans, I think, would be happy with such an outcome. Uh, you know, uh, uh, here in the Baltic states, uh, uh, we are uh, very cons concerned uh, that um, uh, certain military troops of other uh, NATO uh, countries would be permanently uh, located in, uh, in Lithuania, uh, not to wait uh, till we are liberated by NATO uh, members um, after the invasion, which was the case. Uh, it's, uh, it seems that uh, the plan was to liberate Poland, to liberate Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania within 180 days. And as um, Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kala said, nothing would be left in 180 days. Uh, so now the plan is to defend immediately. And uh, in Latvia, it's uh, Canadian troops that are permanently um, uh, residing there. And in Lithuania, it's uh, German troops. Uh, so it, it, uh, Russian propagandists use it as a, uh, something remin reminiscent uh, to the Second World War, look at uh, German tanks uh, with this uh, uh, mm -hmm. symbols of crosses. They are again in the Baltic states. Uh, 
or leopard tanks again uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so they they try to convert all this uh, um, help that the Germany shows this. Uh, uh, solidarity as a return of uh, German fascism. Uh, but I do hope that German society doesn't fall for it uh, and that, that uh, um, German military troops in Lithuania are uh, in a healthy way perceived uh, by German media. But what impression do you get? I think there is a broad uh, public support um, for German um, troops uh, stationed um, um, at other NATO members and especially in uh, in the Baltic uh, uh, states. I think this is um, um, it's um, I don't know about um, the uh, impact uh, on certain sectors of a Russian propaganda. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if Russia today, if you can, you probably can still receive it in I, Germany. I, I will propose not to overestimate this influence because it yeah. was maybe a few time ago. And now, for example, today they more write about Napoleon and because start to remember French, you know, and because they start, uh, you know, to, to discuss that Macron looks like Napoleon, we will fight him, he, <laughs> he forgot everything. It's a. Uh, it looks like you know. It's not. Uh, I would say uh, probably it's not very serious. But in any way, they use this argument against yeah. Germany uh, mm -hmm. because of uh, Second uh, World War, mm -hmm. and you know the threat for. And they would like to create the threat against Germany and how Germany reacts on this threat, yeah. uh, which comes from uh, Kremlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think. I also can't. Uh, I only can hope that also not too many Russians really fall for, for for this kind of obvious uh, um, and very simplistic um, rewriting of history and and um, using these codes that really don't really fit the current situation. Um, I think what is more important in Germany in general is this um, is also the history of the Second World War, and. This you also had in the, the German left. It was very strong that we should, we as Germany, because of the Second World War, we are not in the position to kind of military oppose Russia, who was kind of constructed as Germany's victim uh, in the Second World War. And I think this was also at the beginning, in the first months of the um, full-scale inv invasion, an argument that was very much used. And it's in uh, and especially on the left. And it's interesting that um, the Green Party didn't really fall for it that much. It became a, a staunch supporter of the U Ukraine very quickly. But maybe this has also to do with the influence that um, this is only my personal speculation of Timothy Snyder, who um, uh, gave a talk, um, um, all, yeah, ten years ago to um, uh, Green Party members, um, basically telling them that um, the German or the mm, people who most suffered were Ukrainians. We in Germany perceived them as Russians that kind of died and fought in the war, that were the victims of um, uh, German uh, uh, um, occupation and military violence. Um, but for most Germans, it's, it was kind of equated with the Russians that uh, have kind of suf suffered. And I think that this is an important to kind of make this, uh, um, to draw the line. Um, and this is one of the arguments that is kind of used that, um, of course, Germany has guilt from the Second World War, but it's not just towards the Russians, but we also have a responsibility to the Ukrainian people. And how, and in a certain way, this is how, also the same trope that we are arguing, uh, that we are using, um, that Putin behaves like Hitler. Um, not only Putin claims that Germany is behaving in a kind of fascist way, that Ukraine is run by a uh, fascist nationalist, but also we use this kind of narratives and use history to kind of frame um, uh, contemporary events. And I think that um, um, in Germany, there has been really this shift um, and to kind of re-specify the war guilt of Germany, that we not just own responsibility to um, uh, 
to the Russian people, but also to to other um, people that suffered um, in Central Eastern Europe um, under German uh, occupation. Thank you very much for for all your insights and sharing 